charges to come in and pull anything away because there's no partial charges in oil. Okay? Oil is what we refer to as a hydrophobic substance. Hydrophobic means does not like water. Fears water, literally, is what it means. So a hydrophobic substance will not dissolve in water. Well, what does dissolve in water? Well, things like sodium chloride or ethanol. Ethanol, we'll talk about later, but ethanol makes hydrogen bonds with water and dissolves. Okay. Compounds that dissolve in water we refer to as hydrophilic, meaning likes water. They dissolve in them. So hydrophobic things don't dissolve in water. Hydrophilic things do dissolve in water. OK, so um, this dissolving happens as a function of the hydrogen bonds that happen between the water and the other substances. Or if the other substances have no hydrogen, th nothing to hydrogen bond, then no dissolving occurs. Here's some more interactions. Now we can see here's some hydrogen bonded things. Here's, uh, this could be uh, ethanol, for example, where the R group is, a, is, an, is a, a couple of carbons. This guy doesn't have any ions, but it does have hydrogen. It's, it is capable of forming hydrogen bonds because it has a partial negative, it has a partial positive, and so water can help pull it apart and dissolve it. This can happen for a variety of substances. Okay? A variety of substances. The more hydrogen bonding that a substance can do, the more likely it will dissolve in water. Well, okay, so the world is not as black and white. We always think of the world as black and white. It's not just black and white. The world varies. And, of course, if we had hydrophobic and hydrophilic, it would be all very simple. But then we've got molecules that fit somewhere in between. We call them amphiphilic. A-M-P-H-I. P-H-I-L-I-C. So there's two P-H-I's in there. A-M-P-H-I, P-H-I-L-I-C. Amphiphilic molecules look like this. A real good example of an amphiphilic molecule is soap. Okay? Why is soap an amphiphilic molecule? Well, you'll notice at one end we've got a sodium ion which is positively charged linked to a carboxyl group which is negatively charged. And you can imagine that water could pull this ion off fairly well. And it does. So this end can make, a, make nice bonds with water. This end over here, there's no hydrogen bond. There's no, there's no partial charges. There's nothing for water to grab onto. This part doesn't like water. This part does like water. That's why it's called amphiphilic. It's got properties of both. Well, you say, well, soap dissolves in water, right? And it does. Okay? It dissolves in water, but it does something very interesting in the process of dissolving in water. It forms what's called a micelle. The micelle arranges itself so that the outer part that you see here, the charges, that was that carboxyl group, those negative carboxyl groups, are arranging themselves on the outside, and this actually is three dimensions, it's actually spherical. The outside is all where all the negative charges are. The sodiums have already been pulled away, so they're not even around to be seen anymore. On the inside, these tails that don't like water associate with each other. Okay? So we can think of this spherical structure as being polar on the outside, negative charge, and nonpolar, no charge, on the inside. It's a little ball. Now, the reason that we use soap is so that we can get grease and so forth off of our hands. Grease, being oil, won't dissolve in water. The reason that soap, we use soap is because grease really likes the insides of these micelles. It really likes it. And in fact, grease will get all balled up on the inside of these micelles and soap literally makes the oil in grease soluble. So thanks to amphiphilic substances, we can take things that are not soluble in water and make them soluble in water. Clear as mud? 
What's that? Oh, I'm sorry. M I C E L L E S. My cells. Make sense? All right. So those are some very basic things about charges and water and so forth. And I hope that's just a very good general review for you. All right. Here's some hydrogen bonding going on. Okay. I'm not going to, I don't care if you memorize what a donor is or an acceptor is. The, the reality is I've been teaching biochemistry for 15 years and I've never once asked anybody what a donor bond was or what an acceptor bond was. Okay. It's just a fact to memorize. You get plenty of facts to memorize in here. You won't have to memorize that one. It's more important that you understand what a hydrogen bond is. Something that has a partial positive charge is attracted to something that has a partial negative charge. And notice I said something. Well, one of the somethings has to be a hydrogen. The hydrogen will always have the partial positive charge. The other thing doesn't always have to be oxygen. If we're talking about water, of course it is. But other biological molecules like proteins, like DNA, like other things that we'll talk about, have other things that can help form hydrogen bonds. Look at here. Here's a nitrogen. This nitrogen is something we see on amino acids. And it can form hydrogen bonds because it has a partial negative charge compared to the partial positive charge here. Look at this. There's a hydrogen bond between this partial positive hydrogen and this partial negative nitrogen. So if you remember that hydrogen is always the partial positive, you can always figure out what the partial negative is. It's the thing that the hydrogen is attracted to. Now, there's all kinds of combinations of these that can happen. And these bonds, these hydrogen bonds that we're talking about, are absolutely critical for giving proteins the structure that they do. And probably even more important than that, how many people know that A pairs with T and G pairs with C? Okay. How many people know those happen because of hydrogen bonds? Okay. Those hydrogen bonds hold together your DNA. They hold together your DNA. And you say they're not very strong. I'm going to show you a table in a minute that they're not very strong bonds. You've got very weak bonds holding together your DNA. Does that, get, does that cause you a problem? My DNA is going to come apart, man. I've had mornings where I felt like my DNA was all unraveled. Okay? I'm sure you've had mornings like this, right? You feel like that DNA is all unraveled. It's very weak bonds that hold together your DNA. Why in the world would we want to have that? The reason that we want to have that okay, is because we have to replicate that DNA. And to replicate the DNA, what do we have to do? We have to pull the strands apart. The stronger the bonds are holding the strands together, the harder it is to pull the strands apart, the harder it is to replicate that DNA. Yeah, but if I'm not replicating, what's going on? Well, a hydrogen bond is very weak. But a million hydrogen bonds in a DNA strand are very strong. They add up. So it's very easy for me to pull apart a region because that region only has a few hydrogen bonds. But if I wanted to pull apart all of the strand, I'd have to pull apart a million hydrogen bonds, and that's very strong. Make sense? Questions? The structure of proteins, I said, are partly stabilized by hydrogen bonds. There's other things that can stabilize proteins. Okay. There's other things that can stabilize the structure of proteins. But as we're going to see very soon, protein structure is essential for protein function. If you want to write something down and underline it, that would be a good thing. Protein structure is essential for protein function. If you disrupt or disturb protein structure, you disturb or disrupt protein function. Now, we want to break up some hydrogen bonds. How do we break up some hydrogen bonds? Well, one way we can do it is we can heat it up. If we heat it up, we break hydrogen bonds. When we heat things up, Hydrogen bonds come apart because hydrogen bonds are not very stable to heat. The reason we cook our food is that we are breaking hydrogen bonds in the bacteria that would otherwise kill us. 
in their proteins and in their DNA. When we do that, they can no longer live. That's why we kill bacteria when we cook them. That's why we cook them. We're breaking up those hydrogen bonds that stabilize their proteins, that stabilize their DNA, and voila, they don't stand a chance. Okay? Now, we'll talk more about proteins later, but that just gives you an inkling about why hydrogen bonds are so important. Okay? Same reason we wash our hands with soap. Wash our hands with soap because, again, we're killing bacteria that rely on the proteins and so forth that the soap is coming along and disturbing and denaturing. Okay. You should expect to be able to draw this on the exam. Okay. You shouldn't expect to draw that on the exam. It's kind of a dumb figure, I think. All right. Here's some, here's some more examples of other hydrogen bonds. And no, I'm not going to ask you to draw to make up, do, do all the possible hydrogen bonds and so forth. But I show you these so that you'll recognize that there's a variety of different molecules that can interact with each other via hydrogen bonds or interact with water via hydrogen bonds. Here's an alcohol interacting with water. Here's a ketone interacting with water. Okay. Actually, it's a, well, a carboxyl of a ketone. And here's a, um, I'm sorry, carbonyl of a ketone. And here's an amino group interacting with water. Is it possible for an amino group to interact with a carbonyl group? Yep. Okay. So there's all kinds of possibilities. Whenever I've got a hydrogen there, there's a possibility of a hydrogen bond. The places where we don't see hydrogen bonds are when carbon-hydrogen bonds are involved. Carbon and hydrogen's electronegativities are very similar. We don't see hydrogen bonding possibilities as a result of carbon-hydrogen bonds. Okay? That's why that hydrophobic tail was out there. It was full of carbons and hydrogens, but there were no partial charges because their electronegativities are very, very similar to each other. Okay. Let's see. If you want more possibilities, you can there's all kinds of possibilities of things that are there. Proteins and nucleic acid structures we see down here. Water to other molecules, water and water, et cetera, et cetera. Well, what I hope I've uh, convinced you is that hydrogen bonding is important. What this table uh, shows us is some ver are, are some very important facts. I told you earlier that hydrogen bonds were not very strong. They're not very strong, meaning that we can break them fairly easily. If something is not very strong, we can break it fairly easily. This shows the energy associated with a covalent bond and other things that are non-covalent bonds. About the only ones of these that we're going to talk about is hydrogen bond, about these three right here. We're not going to talk about van der Waals. All right? Covalent bonds. Covalent bonds occur between oxygen and hydrogen. I've already told you that. The bonds in, within a water molecule are, are uh, covalent. Bonds between two hydrogens, we won't talk about those here, but they're also covalent because they have equal electronegativities. Carbon-hydrogen, very similar electronegativities. Okay. Look at their energy. Big number means stronger bond. Strong bonds. The strongest bonds that we have in our body are covalent bonds. The strongest bonds we have in our body are covalent bonds. We compare the energy of a hydrogen bond to the energy of a covalent bond, and we see that we are down 20 to 25 fold. Okay? A hydrogen bond is 1 20th to 1 25th as strong as a covalent bond. It's going to take a lot more energy to pull apart covalent bonds than it does to pull apart hydrogen bonds. When we heat something, when we cook that food, we pull apart hydrogen bonds. We do not pull apart covalent bonds. That actually takes burning it. And probably you, some of you have burned food on occasion as well. You may have broken a few bonds that way. OK. Um, I won't talk about these two right now. We'll, we'll save the discussion of these two bonds for later. But you can see hydrogen, ion dipole, and hydrophobic interactions all 